Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Claire O'Dowd. I'm research curator at the Henry Moore Institute and a very warm welcome to tonight's discussion event, which is part of our series of online talks and lectures exploring different aspects of the portable sculpture exhibition. And portable sculpture is currently entering its final few days at the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds. It closes this Sunday, so this is your last chance to see it. Uh, before we begin this evening, um, just our standard Zoom housekeeping rules apply. So the event's being recorded and it'll be made available on our YouTube channel and on the Henry Moore Institute website. Uh, if you need subtitles or if you have the subtitles and you don't want them, the subtitles can be turned on or off by clicking the CC button for closed captions on the bottom toolbar. If at any point your video freezes or you're having connection issues, we recommend restarting Zoom, Zoom and you can rejoin using the same link and we'll let you back into the webinar. Uh, as always, we want to hear your thoughts and questions throughout the evening, so please do join in. And your questions and comments can be submitted using the chat function, which again is found in the bottom toolbar of your Zoom window. If you want us to mention your name, please include it in the message in the chat function, otherwise we'll keep you anonymous. So it is a great pleasure now to introduce our guest this evening, Jo Melvin. Jo is reader in fine art at Chelsea College of Arts, and she is director and curator of the Barry Flanagan estate. And of course we have two of Barry Flanagan's films in the Portable Sculpture Exhibition. Jo is a writer, curator and researcher whose research is focused on artists and in institutional archives and oral histories, with a particular interest in the relationships between archive documentation and performativity. Jo was Senior Visiting Research Fellow at the Henry Moore Institute in 2015, and it is always a delight to have you back again, Jo. So Joe's recent exhibitions include Barry Flanagan at Icon Gallery in Birmingham in 2019, uh, Memory Game and uh, Machismo in collaboration with Vittoria Bonifatti at Villa Lontana in Rome in 2020 and 2019. And other recent projects include Publication Scaffold in Dublin in 2019, as well as ongoing collaborations with uh, via industry uh, artist books in Foligno and Mahler and Lewitt Studios in Spoleto in Italy. Most recently, Joe has curated the Friaton, uh, a complex exhibition project which opened on the 25th of June this year at Edicola Spoleto and which had um, an echo, um, a supplementary edition. Uh, at Macro, the Museum of Contemporary Arts in Rome on the 6th and 7th of July. Uh, and the Fiaton is a collaborative, performative, uh, networked exhibition uh, featuring artists from different generations and geographical locations who all work in different media and in different ways, but who share common interests in systems, networks, technologies and communication uh, in different forms. And when uh, we were working up to tonight's event, we realized that actually there are a lot of crossovers between the things that we've been working on recently um, and a lot of points in common between the Portable Sculpture Exhibition and the Freaton. Um, so to begin with, Jo, um, a very warm welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, but if we could um, begin by summarizing um, what you spoke about in your lecture. Um, if you haven't seen Joe's lecture, it's now available on our website. Um, and Joe, if you could give us um, a brief sure. summary of, of, the, of what you talked about. Yeah, sure, sure. Thanks, thanks, Claire. Thanks very much. It's always, I have to say, it's always a pleasure to be involved in events at the Henry Moore Institute. And I, I must say, I really miss coming in person. So <laughs> let's hope we can remedy that soon. Um, so yes, thanks for the introduction. Um, the way that I took my, my, my talk, my lecture last week, began with a few um, e examples of different forms of portable sculpture uh, to think about ideas of portability and ideas of what, what, what portability means. Uh, also what it is maybe to have something in one's pocket, um, the feeling of weight, the feeling of 
actually carrying an exhibition around with you um, by having it in your pocket and being able to produce it at various different points. Um, and then I moved on to talking about the feuilleton, uh, which uh, it, the term itself comes from um, comes from a uh, the use of the feuilleton as a political insert or an insert which could be political and uh, largely it is political was political um, which began um, to be taken up hugely by the symbolists and then later throughout the 20th century and arguably continues today and it has had various points of being reignited as as a vehicle um, for slipping something unexpected into a different context, generally in print form. But of course it could be in other form. Uh, it could be on, on, on a, a different form of publication, you know, different, a different manifestation or materialization manifestation of, of um, piggybacking. So the idea of piggybacking um, for me, was central to the way that I thought about this a Dicola project. I mean, um, Claire's mentioned the ex the title of the exhibition, which focuses on an Dicola, which is uh, the Italian word for a newsstand. And so sort of newsstands that we have all over um, small towns and cities. And I was offered this a Dicola, which was a or is a non-functioning newsstand um it's now it now its use now is as a sort of informal tourist information center and i was offered it as a exhibition venue so because it's so tiny obviously the idea of portability was absolutely central because what i wanted to do was utilize the idea of the network because the adicola um the newsstand obviously it immediately in the word news, you know, we're talking about a network of exchange, a dialogue, a crossover, a transaction. Uh, we're talking about what is news, what do we mean by news, or what is, and obviously in the, implicit within that is how do we determine it to be valid news, what is valid, what is invalid, and so on. So immediately the, the notion of the newsstand um, sets up these different polarities, these different points of slippage, these different points of reference. Um, and the way that I took the project was to invite many different artists and states from different countries to either, either to collaborate on devising a new work which utilised this form of system and exchange, uh, or to resituate an older work, something, you know, that exists, certainly obviously with the artist's estates. And there were two echoes. There was the one uh, in Macro, um, which took place in the non-exhibition spaces. So in the foyer, uh, outside, you know, in the in the cafe or restaurant where there were, were lots of music. Um, and also in an edicola in Santa Maria in Trastevere, um, which in, in front of the church there in Rome, um, at, the uh, curated by Vittorio Bonafatti, with whom I collaborate on on Villa Lontana, and I I invited I asked Vittoria to run with the idea and to see you know where she wanted to take it, and and she proposed to, to take another edicola and to take one in Rome. So that edicola in Rome happened at the same time as Macro, and additionally for one more day. And the edicola in Rome was a functioning, or is a functioning edicola. So the insert there in, included uh, a collection of, of uh, publications in one of the windows, that was in one of the windows, and interventions by two artists, which were, you know, in this piggybacking fashion, subverting the expectations. There was a postcard, um, which I have here actually. Uh, which I think you can see, Amore Mio, uh, and and there was also the Anne James Chatton Seno Stato Qui, the receipts, uh, which is a, you know like a till receipt, and Seno Stato Qui is I am here, and it had the name of the of the edicola on it, the name of the exhibition, and obviously the time of the of the receipt set, sent. 
So you know, immediately, you know, we have a we have a location, a point of of um, simultaneity, a point of a point of anchorage, and the notion of the transaction or transmission going between. And there was a QR code as well. So <clears throat> that's a sort of brief, very brief summary of what I spoke about. I'm taking a few of the artist's works that I worked with, some of the artists I worked with, and then showing some photos of the site, um, the different sites, and the ideas of transactions and um, passing through with regard to news and newsworthiness. Yeah, so you worked with a very large number of artists. Yeah. There's, a, there's a, a huge list of, of artists. And as you say, some of the works were older works that were in estates and archives, but yeah. many of them were newly developed for yeah. the exhibition. Yeah. And the artists seem to have been incredibly resourceful and yeah. inventive in terms of how they've approached this. Because presumably at the time when this was all being planned and the exhibition was mounted, yeah. um, there were restrictions on what people could do and, and where people could go and so on. And I think we we had similar issues at, a, at the same time, you and I, in terms of yeah. generating these exhibitions. But the artists have, have done some fabulous things. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think we, we had very similar uh, restrictions. I mean, um, obviously the circumstances are completely different. Mm. I was like, literally, uh, as it, is working as it were working on my own you know not as part of an institution yeah uh, Nicola isn't an institution it's um <clears throat> you know it's a it's a it's a newsstand in the middle of Spoleto and uh the person who offered it to me is a artist based in Spoleto a man called Franco Troiani who is who's, who's lived in Spoleto all his life and works extensively with artists um from Italy um, and and actually has set up a uh, an exhibition program that that uh, takes place along the Via Flaminia, which is the main road north from Rome to the Alps, and historically has been you know has been ex has existed since certainly Etruscan pre-Etruscan times, and al along this road there are many sites both religious sites, sites of marketplaces, um, sites, sites of where people would obviously sleep, you know, so settlements, different for different forms and different reasons. And, the, and Spoleto is on, on the Via Flaminia. And um, Franco Troiani has, has had exhibitions which have, in a way, they've been travelling or they've required travel between venues. And he's worked with many artists, um, to realise these projects, and I mean, he one one of the artists that Franco worked with um, is Solowit, who lived in Spoleto, hence the association with the uh, Marler and the Witt Studios. Um, and so, you know, these kinds of these kinds of interchanges between artists of different generations mm. was something that I found very interesting. And then, you know, if you think of um, on the road up from. Spoleto, um, further north, you get not that far, about 35 miles, maybe even 35 kilometres, uh, you get to, to Assisi. And Assisi is, I suspect, most famous for St Francis of Assisi. And then, of course, the Giotto paintings that are there and how those Giotto paintings have affected artists of so many generations and nationalities, you know, in so many different ways that it would be, you know, almost impossible even to to begin to frame those various ways. And so, in a weird sort of way, this Adicola is uh, like a way to frame the unframable, uh, mm -hmm. and yet carry it as you're doing, carry it in a portable fashion. So that these, so portable sculpture is like a portable, the idea of portability, the ideas that matter to us, and how we transmute them how we make them available in different places and different contexts so I was very restricted because mm. funding that I had been promised um, disappeared um, 
for the obvious reasons of, you know, nobody's prepared to fund anything with the COVID situation. And borders being enclosed meant that, you know, funding from, you know, within the countries would only fund artists within the country, not any kind of transaction across, or across to somewhere else. And so one is obviously limited by, you know, artist willingness to be yeah. involved in something like this my willingness to be involved in something like this um and and you know sort of how are we going to make it work so the way to make it work is to make it transmittable so either it has to be so small it can go into my my suitcase which was obviously we have such a precedent for with exhibitions over over um more than 100 years um and 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 you know transmission so obviously yeah. the internet yeah and yeah. So, yeah. So that that you had to be incredibly resourceful as well. Mm. And attentive. Um, and the, there's some incredible projects in this that that really challenge the idea of what the site of an exhibition should be or could be. Um, that I mean, your approach is is so different to mine. Mine is very much enclosed within an institution within a, a kind of white wall gallery, but yeah yours is out on the street uh yeah. there's people passing by people picking things up and there's yeah. receipts going from edicola to edicola <laughs> exactly, exactly exactly yeah so there's, there's all kinds of networks and 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 systems that are being interfered with or, or intervened in across different sites mm. um so do how do you how did you Kind of think of the idea of the the site for this exhibition. Um, I thought of it. It's it's. I th thought of it in very many different ways, and I think one of the ways that, for me, is the most important is the one that's the least visible, and that is more of a idea of a kind of meta structure of sight. So. Mm -hmm how we carry an idea of site or location internally and how we might conjure with memories of a particular site you know i mean i think of any any right i mean immediately obviously proust and the writing mm -hmm. you know the room all the different places of the bed within the space and how that is part of all of our ways of coping with the world this imaginative space which recalls a particular site so for me the imaginative space of Spoleto um, manifested by the Edicola contains so much extraordinary uh, notion of history that is connected also with the land mm -hmm. uh, and then because it's connected with the land connected with ways that people have framed the land in language so the idea of a mountain the idea of a river the idea of a bridge a tree all these things that we see on a daily basis and how it is informed by where we are and how we think of it so you know it, within England we have different ways of talking about you know particular historical sites or hills or I don't know copses of wood or you know these types of natural phenomena you know colloquial expressions or you know different regional ways of defining these things and so I was thinking about this in relation to Spoleto I was thinking about it in relation to the antiqueness and ancientness mm -hmm. of walking and how fundamental it is for us to utilize you know as a way to get from one place to another and how walking became very important for huge numbers of people recently um, during you know lockdown and being allowed to go out for I don't know one exercise a day or whatever it was you know and all these terrible restrictions that we had so all these things were informing how I was thinking about sight and how I was thinking about walking and how walking also becomes like a meditative situation. So, I mean, obviously with, I mentioned Spoleto and Assisi and St. Francis and these paths that St. Francis apparently took uh, to get from Rome to Assisi, um, from Rome to, you know, see, you know the, the, the holy city or whatever it's called. 
um, and and passing through these places um, becomes like a homage, a repetition, an echo. Uh, but it taps into something way before St. Francis, because these paths obviously were routes that yeah. passed through, you know, made it easier to get through the hills. <laughs> And so that notion of sight and the notion of how that sight has changed and how the um, geological structure around the site has changed so that, you know, there's a lot of earthquakes around there. So mm -hmm. how that impacts on the land and how the land is uh, seen, represented and depicted and how all these things become uh like points or anchors for us a bit like if we were rock climbing you know grabbing the next thing so it's 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 both an internal way of thinking about sight and how we carry it with us plus a sort of meditative experience of walking and and then there's these kinds of flashes of interaction that we have in these moments you know these these points that we have exchange so here you, you know we have a we have a, um, a walk around Spoleto uh, mm -hmm. it's called um, um, the Giro it goes around the main rock of Spoleto uh, on which there's a castle um, and um, on the right of course of this slide you see Goethe and um, Goethe was one of the many 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 people who stopped in Spoleto because it was a site of natural beauty. And here the, the viaduct, um, that you know, uh, aqueduct that um, it was a Roman aqueduct and then it was used and reused and built upon in the medieval uh, era and used as a functioning uh, aqueduct. And it's uh, you know, considered to be a sublime site, a site of majesty and you know, paint, much painted. Uh, it's also referred to as the um, the suicide bridge, um, and then you know these these old fashioned um, communication networks uh, networks of of uh, you know cables, electricity, gas, etc. Um, you know the the ways of of transporting um, essentials, and then then you have the picture, you know the actual edicola, the newsstand itself. And the Duomo of, of Spoleto, um, which is, you know, a Byzantine, um, a Byzantine facade, a Byzantine slide. Um, and then here, you know, some of the different interventions um, of artists working with the, with the edicola. So uh, the, you can see the, the numbers in the slide, the, the white numbers on the top of the, of the, window there that was um, a project called Numbers which was a sound work by um, a guy uh, an Italian artist called Giorgio Orbi and he picked up on a game which is called Numbers uh, actually it might have a different title sorry about that I don't have it right in my head but it's an ancient game um, certainly there are there's documentation of it existing pre-Greek uh, and it's a, na a, a name, a, a game played by calling out numbers and that, uh, with, with sort of counters. And these counters are used to goad the, you know, the, the, the opponents to calling louder numbers. And it, it I, I don't understand the game at all, but it reaches a huge climax when, at the highest number. And, and this game takes a number of hours to play, two hours or three hours. And it's dying out and it's taken various forms. And, you know, to think again about language, you know, this game was definitely played in f f across the Mediterranean area. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and, you know, with different languages being used, but the same game. Uh, and then it, it's still played now. And, it, and, the, and the, the numbers is um, played like different with in different dialects and different forms of Italy. I don't know whether it's still played in Greece. Uh, but you know it's just it's just a sort of interesting way of like connecting place, location, language, yeah. time. So the, the the artists were were thinking about the, the location and the history yeah. and the site as exactly. well. Exactly, and exactly. I mean I how I, to, I how to deal with that in the work. 
absolutely i mean i kind of you know i i i sense um you know a kind of like descriptions of what i was thinking about in relation to the project so that there would be something like um you know like a, a like an exchange you know like you know a game of chess so we have this this is our this is our template this is our playing field if you like and how are we going to interact with it and do you want to interact with me about this site so that there is immediately an exchange there's an exchange between me and the artist or artists uh, crossing over with this uh, idea and and then thinking about the permeability of that idea and what they come up with and how how it is made malleable by these ideas so they're working you know like within these ideas and generating something which generates its own energy its own impetus and you know with these artists who made work for for the for the exhibition obviously it's shown for the first time mm -hmm. um and you know will be shown in other contexts no doubt um in many cases and you know all will be documented <laughs> and then become something else which goes into a whole different realm but um yeah um so, so there, there are there are so many different ideas of sight going on in here and and one of yeah. the ones that that really strikes me about your exhibition is the the publication aspect of it and, yeah. and the, how that becomes not only another another object art object within the exhibition but also another site for the exhibition and another site if you like for the, all the ideas of exchange and communication that sure. have sure. gone into it yes um, and the, and you you spoke a lot in your lecture about how um the different kinds of publication work within this this exhibition yeah can you say a bit more about that and about how that relates to these different ideas of sight and 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 history and communication and so on yeah um it's, yeah. A, it's a huge subject <laughs> it's um extremely interesting and absolutely fascinating and uh i mean something that i think we both grapple with all the time in different ways um so yeah i mean the the idea publication publication as exhibition is something that's always really fascinated me um you know the actual i suppose the ideality of it you know the fact that it can be published in any form um and so it can be an exhibition so then we start to think about a book uh, mm. and obviously you know many people have been thinking about books as exhibition for a very long time you know long before the 60s you know with a with, you know, surrealists and you know symbolists making exhibitions out of books. So, and then and then separate from that, there's the book as art or art, you know, which is a different thing from publication as exhibition. And the the forms of the forms of of publication as exhibition. Um, the uh, something extraordinarily fluid about it, which I really enjoy, uh, and the fact that. Ideally, it should be cheap uh, and even throwaway. But then the irony is, of course, it becomes collectible, um, and um, so that the ideal is commodified. Um, now, I'm I wrestle with that as well because the commodification of the object it enables us to transport it and to carry it. Uh, there's something that I think any of us who've been who is involved with exhibition making of any form has been grappling with how to render these uh, as something to be experienced in a different form. So obviously there's a lot of work that happens, which is made uh, for internet. I mean, made made for live uh, viewing on the internet. Um, but there's an awful lot of exhibitions that are simply plonked up like uh, pictures of works hung in a space. And that's presented then as an exhibition. Um, but of course it isn't. I mean, mm. I would say, of course it isn't. Uh, someone else might say some, but of course it is. Uh, I would say, well, it's a documentation of an exhibition, um, which is a very different thing. Um, mm. 
and that what I like about publication as exhibition is that it's not documentation of exhibition, that it is actually the exhibition. So if we then have something that's devised for the net as exhibition, then it isn't a documentation, it is the exhibition. And how that's then, how that's then incorporated into our way of framing uh, history, art history, and then commodified is something else. And in a way, I think when we're actually at the cutting edge of this, and cutting edge is such a ridiculous term to use now, but still one's kind of grappling at the rock face with dealing with these things. Um, once it becomes commodified, it's both it's both immensely satisfying and immensely frustrating because then it's entered the culture and it becomes something to be repeated. And then that repetition always needs to be kept on its toes in order for it to be something that anyone can really meaningfully grasp it, you know, and, and feel incorporated by it, subsumed by it, excited by it, which is so different for me, speaking personally, than a kind of more traditional notion of looking at history, which is like as if it's done. And then, oh, we yeah. look at it, we, you know, we kind of dust it down and we look at it and we think, oh, yes, it's very interesting. I know. And, but it's it's sort of something that's over there. It's not something that we can actually experience now meaningfully. It's in a it's in it's in the sense of it's within its existing parameters. Mm. And I think what's something about this idea of the edicular and the idea of sight that is so important is that existing parameters are like an earthquake. They're subject. They're subject to flux always. And if we can't take that risk of allowing it to become unhinged, which is obviously in one way um, impossible, but another way it's something to aim towards, um, is when that idea is worth grappling with and is exciting. And for me, it's the idea of sight and portability and exhibition as publication has, well, almost for 25 years, which is a very long time, kept me kind of on my toes. Mm. You know, is what I find most um, full, shall we say, meaty. Uh, well, I don't like the word meaty, but you know, the most compact uh, yeah. and dense, um, but also ironically light. So, it's <laughs> yeah. a really interesting way of putting it. Yeah, because yeah. when you think about exhibition as publication, it, it, it's hard to get your head around the idea that that is kind of the opposite of yeah. the exhibition publication, the, the, the catalogue that you might think of in terms of exhibition. And it becomes something completely totally different. The, these yeah. possibilities that it generates are just... Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So, I mean, that, oh, the, the, some of the, the publication things that came up in your exhibition can we can we have a look at some more of these because they of course the um which one the, and a, a, the, like the whole concept of a newsstand yes containing these things is just, just brilliant so the, the, there was also the um oh goodness there were so many of them they there were a lot of the, the barry flanagan's funds reappears yeah 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 a lot in this which i love that's a fantastic yeah. thing and, and the, all the art and language works but um, yeah. There's also the um, things like the art and language posters and um, the Ale Topo issue, the, yes. the Jimmy, Jimmy Dummer, Durham one. Where, yes, yes, that's a couple of things yes. here. Yeah, yes, exactly, 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 exactly. It's so many different things here in this in this slide that we're looking at now. There's a there's a publication uh, on, you see on the floor down there, there's work of David Rickard, um, these posters which show representations, they sh show like a, a, a print which has been made from a watercolour of the sea, of the English Channel. Um, and this has, this has been blown onto the side of a sort of large-ish poster. 
and it says knife edge and he did uh, three versions of a poster uh, that is like something that you pick up at a newsstand or the size of a paper uh, and the headlines come from a combination of Brexit and Covid and uh, obviously the channel became you know like a, a major point of of division between the UK and Europe uh, but also it's a geological formation because at one point obviously they, they were connected you know these lands um, and then the distilled water that he used in order to <clears throat> make the, the watercolour of the sea, uh, which is then processed as a print and then reproduced, you know, mul multiple times as a, as a newspaper, immediately involves all these kinds of points of exchange and points of interaction and, yeah. polit and the, and the polit politicisation of the channel, you know, what we call the channel whether we call it the La Marche or the Channel and and I mean you know there's just so much horribleness connected with it you know, with people trying to get into the UK um, through the through the channel along the channel or in the tunnel um, and uh, and then and then so that's one project and then and then on the top you see there are many many different projects um, made yeah. by artists especially for the exhibition um, and each of them take either a, what we might describe as a big P, big political um, uh, inter insertion or piggyback within the, the concept of the publication, or something which is actually quite subtle. And it's so subtle that it's so slight, but it's um, the inflection of what it gets the person holding it to think of is 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 so in a way profound that mm -hmm. it's difficult really to frame um difficult really to to summarize and put words on um and then uh, your love is my country these uh, posters are are tim o'reilly and there there were a number that he made um and uh, then down at the other end the words are an italian artist um elena uh, Lucarini and in its like statements made from an ex sort of a projected exchange of the experience of 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 a kind of trans a sort of fluid identity uh, and then and then on the table there's there's uh, in the green there's a card of Echo Soga, which is, do you speak the language of plants and fauna? Uh, and, it, you know, and then there's a there's a site that you can contact her on. So, uh, you know, the, a number of artists, um, Kate Atkins also made reference to uh, the mm -hmm. site, the website as an exhibition space and, and the whole process of the research for the project coming from uh, encountering the, the town through um, Google Maps. Yeah, I love the Kate Atkins one. That was just a, such a nice way of, of it, it said such a lot about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have a slide of that. The image it was made. Um, let's let's find Kate. Atkins. Yeah, you go down a bit lower. Okay, there okay yes, next there, number thirty-seven and thirty-eight. Yeah, and it, it's such a. It's kind of it's so simple, but it's so beautifully yeah. done and so yeah. imaginative and it's such a clever way of engaging with these the the, this whole new system of, of exactly mapping and, and documentation exactly. and exactly. Things no, within, exactly. within exactly. the project exactly and, and the most radical thing to, to just give it all away as well to just yes. make it freely available and, absolutely absolutely yeah. and which make which give, gives it the what i'm talking about this sort of incredible kind of compactness or density mm. but also light you know that um there's something really magical about that almost impossible transaction of opposites yes which is you know it's it's, it's it makes life worth living when we get uh, you know this kind of transactions going on absolutely but, yeah i think there's some of the the interventions into systems and 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 kind of aspects of bureaucracy that are in this are, are great and that that it had real resonance for me with some of the things that that are in the portable sculpture exhibition yes can we can we have a look at Anne james 
chat on um, Sonos that repeat. Yes, uh, you need to go up slightly. Uh, and there we have number 27. <laughs> this is this is such a simple but such a, it's so clever I love it so the, this is a, a receipt printed out in uh, the Edicola yes in the newsstand yeah which says I am here yeah on it with the, the date and the time yeah and then it's it there's another Edicola near macro where yeah. the same thing is happening yeah and there's two different locations for this and you get these these printouts that prove that not only were you here, but the artist was here at yeah. this particular date and time. And it's it's and then the, yet again a QR code, so you know things can be shared yeah. further. But it's an intervention in these kind of these systems of communication and exchange and and you know exactly. consumption in an ethical buying stuff. But exactly. it, it's yeah. so simple, <laughs> so clever. Yeah. And the, and the other part of, of his project was to make these posters and mm. he's here fly posting in in Spoleto and he was fly posting over the top of the uh, the the posters the official posters for the uh, festival of two worlds from last year and uh, and he put, he did fly posting all over all over the city of, of Spoleto and also around the site of Macro and around the site of of the um Adicola in, in Santa Maria in Trastevere. It's so so there were three places where there were these posters spreading from the Adicola, you know, like taking their own forms of network. And obviously he was walking between all these places, carrying the, you know, the paste paste stuff to to do the job. And then sometimes people made in their own um feuilleton onto these posters and and these were quite interesting in themselves and they you know he took them down or tried to take them down in order to do something else with these things so the kind of the layering continues which is really great that's fascinating oh it's great that people engaged with it yeah on kind of level that kind of proves your point really i think but i think that's <laughs> the thing that's really nice when you get all these different people engaging and that's one of the things about doing it on the street that mm. it make, it's so much harder um, when you're inside an institution to get that sort of street engagement, isn't it? Actually, to get people to come in through the door, um, and and you know immediately you remove that enclosure, you know you get people interacting, and this whole sense of there's no worrying about whether or not this is so-called art is this art is it not who cares you know mm -hmm. this is actually a point of a transaction and exchange and i think that when we curate within institutions we have to deal with that somehow and that's makes it so different yes i think that is a very astute observation we've, we've had very different ex experiences with these these exhibitions very different but it's really nice to see so many points of convergence. And yeah, I agree. To I know agree. that people are, are thinking about the similar things and that we're all kind of mulling over similar questions. Yeah, and we're all grappling with it. Grappling is the yeah. word. Very definitely. <laughs> I think that is a good note to end on, Joe. Yeah. At this time. <laughs> yes. So thank you so much for a fascinating conversation and for... Uh, some introducing me to some really really fascinating artworks and artists so I'm delighted to have seen them well very good to have this conversation and let's continue grappling absolutely here's to the grappling <laughs> well thank you very much to joe and thank you for all of you for joining us and if you want to catch the portable sculpture exhibition it, it's on until sunday and then it's gone uh, and Joe's exhibition, uh, if you happen to be in Spoleto, is open until the 31st of August. Actually, <clears throat> I had to close it, um, but there are traces of it still there. Traces of it, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can see traces of Joe's exhibition in Spoleto. Um, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, and this, is, this has been a great way to finish our series of online events for Portable Sculpture. So thank you very much to Joe and everybody for joining us. And, and thank you. Thank you for having me.